Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Clinically Correlate with Asfran Vedant. Today we have a very interesting uh, guest, one of our most interesting attendings, I would say, working at Penn, Dr. Harry Jiao with us today. Harry, thank you so much for being here with us. In this episode, we kind of get into a multitude of topics uh, of different flavors, actually. So first, we delve into whether AI possesses an existential threat to radiologists and how we can prevent ourselves in becoming cogs in the wheel of this giant industrial medical industrial complex. Uh, we also get a little bit into academia, the current situation in academia, tenure tracks, social media and its influence on the academic medicine and academic radiology in general. We get a little bit into Harry's vision into his own podcast, The Radiologist. Um, and lastly, we end with a few hot takes, uh, Harry's opinions, which you know, he has been giving throughout the <laughs> episode. But of course, as we thought were hot takes, uh, you know, the value of incidental findings um, and other good stuff. And if you want to follow Harry, we'll put his social media tag, his Twitter or X tag down below. It's a very interesting account that all of you guys should definitely follow. Uh, but So without further ado, Harry... Thank you so much for being here. Once again, we'll jump right into it. So Harry, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, why did you pick radiology and why did you choose Penn Radiology uh, as your training program and as kind of a place where you have your career? Well, thanks for having me. I think the, I'm going to be brief as there's a tendency to go on and on and it's like radiology reports. <laughs> it can be very loquacious. Uh, fundamentally, I, I didn't start in med, um, radiology, I started in surgery. And I went into radiology to help other physicians make better diagnosis. So I thought I always thought of myself as being the doctor's doctor. Um, I trained in the UK. I was traveling to Australia for a um, kind of like a surgical year in one of their outback hospitals. I transited through Philadelphia. And it's not so much that I picked. <laughs> <laughs> Penn. It's that I applied to a bunch of places, including Penn, and I got accepted. And um, once I got accepted, it was a no-brainer. So at that point, I was thinking surgery, interventional radiology, and then finally I gravitated towards diagnostic radiology. Uh, the faculty part is uh, was where I had more choice, uh, although not that much more choice, but some, uh, some more choice because I was on a... Um, immigrant visa, H-1 visa, so I couldn't keep, I didn't have the luxury to go wherever I wanted. But the essential question was between academia and private practice. And at the time, the differential in salary was quite a bit between the two. Now it's converged somewhat. But academia just seemed to be more intellectually interesting. And there were opportunities at Penn, uh, notably in Wharton and Leonard Davis Institute that uh, just made it more interesting. So I was always about, you know, let's do something more interesting, but that's essentially why I stayed on as faculty. Nice. And kind of like a follow up to that, you know, why cardiothoracic radiology? Well, cardiovascular back in 2008, I don't want to reveal my age, <laughs> um, was actually quite a um, up and coming field uh, because technology hadn't advanced to the extent that you see right now. And there was a lot more of a combination of um, understanding physics, understanding clinical question, physiology, putting it all together. So it, um, it, uh, it was a rising field. And also there was a feeling then, and as it is the case right now, that radiologists tended to run away from the heart which was a bit of a silly thing to do because the heart's in the chest. You can't ignore it. We're kind of all cardiac images by default. So I found it a, a, a niche more than a calling, a void. Um, in my past life, I did some uh, work in the emergency department because we all had to go through it. And I was also a, um, uh, a junior doctor in cardiac surgery. So... By virtue of those two fields, I ended up having a fairly reasonable understanding of quite a bit of decision-making in involving the heart. I used to also be um, 
uh, a trainer in advanced life support now, please don't call me to a code. I wouldn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> I'll probably just bite my nails. <laughs> uh, so all that, you know, kind of gave me a little bit of, um, uh, uh, so it seemed to be a decent choice. Um, I think a lot more of you should choose cardiovascular so than me <laughs> as, as a fellowship and as a career choice because it's a, it's a void. It's not, everybody goes towards MSK and oncology and mammo and neuro. But this is like one of those untouched areas. I think it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, it, uh, how the landscape of radiology and the landscape of cardiovascular imaging kind of changed throughout the years. I think for most of us in training, you know, we kind of view it in the lens of what's interesting today, you know, what do I find satisfying, what's up and coming, you know, uh, and then sort of pick our specialties like that. Because I find it really hard to believe unless you know, you've had a huge prior exposure, prior to residency, you know, we kind of have kind of developed a super huge passion for one particular field over another. I think at the in the end, we kind of fall into one and we say, you know what, yeah, you know, it's up and coming right now, I'll just do that. Whatever. But I feel like a lot of us can do many different of these subspecialties in radiology. We can fit right in to many of these. Absolutely. And also, the radiologist may be the last generalist. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we're kind of the only field that gets a head-to-toe training. In our training, everybody gets it during med school, but we actually get it after med school. The problem is that there's, of course, a lot of knowledge that is um, growing. And there's a tendency to mistake uh, the specialization of knowledge for its utility. You could say that, oh, you know, stuff is changing every week. There's a new publication every week out. So if you're not up to date with it, um, you're kind of useless. But that's not true. I mean, if you look back and see what the actual the vector of change has been it hasn't been a lot in many of the, many things a lot of things that you think ebm is telling you to do in one way two weeks later it'll tell you to do something completely different so if you close your eyes and you know fell asleep for five years probably wouldn't make that much of a difference in your overall knowledge base although the the appearance is that it would it wouldn't so in reality the generalist approach um, with some general principles. And one of the biggest things that we do in radiology, what we train ourselves to do, is to look at things in both an anatomical pattern and also a pathophysiological pattern. And if you really are kind of you know, a Jedi, we combine that with a pretest probability. Um, and that's a lot of information to process. So I, I don't think there are very many fields that process as much information as we do and make decisions uh, as we do. We make a lot of decisions. Um, it just doesn't appear that way. It's much more fluid in our mind how we make those decisions. So I think that's a perfect segue to our next con conversation topic. Um, you, know, you recently wrote an article called Algorithms at the Gate about artificial intelligence and its role in radiology. And you know, kind of piggybacking what you just said, given that AI has the potential to be able to incorporate all that um, different amount of information in a way that's kind of equivalent or faster than a human radiologist, what's the you know, global impact of that in the practice of radiology and the business of radiology? So you, know, you concluded in the article that ultimately you know, AI could allow radiologists to work at the top of their license. Do you think that's a good thing? Well, it depends who you ask. A lot of people these days are happily in their pajamas sitting in Colorado with a view of the mountains churning stuff out, you know, x-ray after x-ray after x-ray, um, measuring the nodes, telling you whether they're bigger or smaller. Um, you don't need a medical degree to do that. And so when people think about the biggest threat to radiology, it isn't AI. It's the fact that the field has democratized so much and has become very quantitative. And the fact is that you don't need a high cognitive level to do a lot of what we do. So the first thing is that 
radiologists have been comfortable in that role, even though they complain about burnout. I don't meet many radiologists that will say, okay, I'll take half the pay for, you know, half the work. So it's kind of like, you know, it's one of those facile arguments people make all the time. Um, but the thing is, what does working at the level top of your license even mean? I suppose it gets down to what I think is being the doctor's doctor. Like a um, uh, chap you, will, you was before your time, Wally Miller Sr., who was the father of another chest radiologist, Wally Miller Jr., uh, Wally Miller Senior used to be, um, you know, was was um, somebody who uh, teams of people, whether they were transplant surgeons or medical students, would wait to discuss cases. You know, the X-ray up, but he would discuss cases based on his knowledge of clinical medicine. The X-ray was actually incidental. It was like you know, clinical medicine was his. He was, you know, he had a great knowledge of that. He was well read. He understood symptoms and the differential and all of that. And that is a very different way of practicing to how we practice today. The way we practice today, and it's it becomes innate, uh, that's what you, how you practice, because that's how you're taught to practice, is let's get through as many cases as possible. Um, now, the thing is going to be that not everything that we do is of a high cognitive level. Some things we do are of an ultra high cognitive level, and other things are just. If you get a if you get an X ray, and you're in place of scarcity, and you look at the X ray and you put everything, put all the context in, you come up with a diagnosis like Legionella pneumonia. Whereas you do an X ray here, you're doing another one in four hours, and then you're doing another one in two hours. The third X ray. Any, anyone can read that. Because the third x-ray, the humerus hasn't moved, hopefully. Uh, the ribs are still intact, mostly. So all you're really saying is, where is that line that you put in, in relationship to some anatomical landmark that is arbitrary that anybody can come up with? That third x-ray does not require a medical degree. The second x-ray probably doesn't either. And the first X-ray may, except we have a CT. So um, at least I can speak for myself when I say that I don't read an X-ray until I see it. When I don't read a trauma X-ray until I see the CT, and then I see that wide and mediastinum, I say oh, that's just projectional. So the question always to ask is: Does what I do require a medical degree? Six years of training, plus all of that. Now, I'm not saying that radiology is easy, but I think it has become devalued by the frequency and repetition of use, by its quantitative parameters that we provide, that anybody can provide, and AI can provide. But it requires a completely different mindset to go from that, um, you know, go from that RVU generating. Um, mindset to one where you step back and try and act more like Wally Miller Senior did. In an environment that you are still held to an RVU standard, do you think that with AI there's no way to be able to maintain the RVUs if you're going for a quality metric and providing real clinical knowledge? Because a lot of our studies that can create a lot of RVUs pretty rapidly are the negative studies. Yeah, so there's another chap um, before your time, another legendary radiologist, Igor Lofer. Um, he was a GI radiologist. He once said to me, I had a fluoroscopic study on, uh, on call, and he once said to me, you get paid for the difficult cases. It's a pretty profound thing, although I didn't quite appreciate it at 9 a.m. <laughs> I was first call. I think his point was that you got to do all these routine stuff, the automatic stuff, but it's the one in between that will really test your, that really creates value for you. So, yes, we are in that RVU kind of, you know, what I call the productivity quagmire. Um, but it's within that that you have to create value and step out every now and then and find moments 
they can't be they may not be nine to ten hours a day but they have to be some where you can create value and um, now you might say well aren't you creating value there I mean technically speaking in some ways or the other yes you are because you're getting through stuff you're trying to spot lines and tubes that are misplaced and um, the clinical team probably might not if you if, without your help um, but it's within that framework you have to do that I find it quite I, I, I'm quite uncomfortable when radiologists ask for a metric and ask to be incentivized to do certain things that could boost your value because on the other hand the same radiologist claims oh I feel like a commodity and then they behave like one because when you say I won't do it unless you incentivize me then you're a commodity you're fundamentally a commodity because that's what commodity that's what people do I mean that's what people that look at the it's what people at McDonald's do. It's 5 p.m. I need to go home. So you can't, you know, complain about being that and yet act in that manner. You have to do it within the framework that you have. And of course, it depends on the leadership. The leadership has to be of the type that encourages that. And encouragement isn't always financial. It can be um, driven by um, praise and uh, just... I'm beginning to sound nebulous because I can't think of other ways because aside from the uh, finance. So maybe I'm a commodity too. Do you think value-based care would change that? Well, I think they've tried that and it's not that easy. I mean, they've tried the HMO version years ago and there was a lot of pushback because it was always the third parties that tried to... Um, say what you should or should not do uh, and then they you know the old rose by another name they changed the HMO name to an ACO and pretended that it was completely radically different but it wasn't um, so uh, people have come up with all sorts of um, predictions you know if radiology is a cost center instead of a um, our view generator maybe radiologists will be held in more higher regard. And I think the problem here is that if we cannot, within the RVU um, framework, kind of push for value, um, push for things that are not necessarily things that just mean greater production, then I think the failing is ours. Because you can't wait for a perfect set of circumstances. And you just have to do it from within. And it's, I, I think it's poor excuses for radiologists that say that, oh, I, I will wait until I'm incentivized, or what's my incentive to talk to a physician? You just have to do it. Uh, you have to do it, and you have to do all the other stuff as well. And maybe take a bit of a pay cut and do it, or maybe work harder, come in earlier, or do something. It's the same thing with teaching. I mean, um, nobody has time to teach, right? And by the way, the fact that nobody has time to teach isn't a bad thing for you guys because all you're doing is you're basically churning through the studies. So you're becoming excellent private practice radiologists because of that circumstance. But you're not really enjoying, you're not really being nourished. Your mind isn't being nourished. You're not appreciating the art for what it is. So people say, oh, we haven't got time to teach or we haven't incentivized or, you know, those that teach, they're penalized. But then you just have to take them on the chin. You just have to say, okay, this is more important. I mean, the, you know, life would be very good if you were given space to, you could have everything in the world. The reason you have to make a choice is because you have to uh, you know, you have to value certain things. You know, you value certain things differently. Um, if you really want to teach and you think that's your calling, then stay longer, come earlier, read faster, or make less. And that's what you should do. Otherwise, you're a commodity, quite frankly. Wise words. Letting it all sink in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I try and hold myself to the same standards, although I'm more forgiving myself than others. <laughs> 
But, but I, I, I think this sort of excuse making is what radiology has done, whilst enjoying the fruits of a system that has delivered efficiency and good compensation thanks to its RVU model. So now it just seems, well, you know, you should have tried to innovate within. You think now with AI innovating outside of radiology, given that the scans can be interpreted kind of independent from the radiology's workflow, that there, we've kind of lost our chance from innovating from within? No, I think that um, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to uh, take that away from radiology because even if you have a scan that is, uh, let's say you have a head triaging tool, a head CT triaging tool that looks for um, uh, LVO and uh, hemorrhage, uh, it's not going to be perfect. Um, there's going to be some false positives and somebody's got to deal with them, but you don't know who's a false positive or not. So whilst it may alert the neurologist to coming to the scanner earlier, it'll still involve the radiologist by somebody has to read the false positive. So the way the workflow is, and given the volumes, it's going to be very difficult for a non-radiologist to cope. So we're kind of needed because these studies have to be read. One of the things, you know, you've been in academia since finishing your training, right? In your opinion, you know, in today's academic landscape, does tenure truly exist? Well, I guess the question is, um, what are we trying to achieve by tenure? And what would happen in the absence of it? And if we're trying to achieve unfiltered academic freedom, Nothing's going to be 100%, but to the extent that it's possible, I think it, is, it does exist. If I have an opinion and I share it loudly and I expect everybody to love me, despite that opinion being against the grain of what they do, I don't think either the American Constitution or tenure prom promises you that. So there are market forces that are indirectly very censorious. And this is the bit which people have difficulty grasping. That, sure, you have a right to an opinion, but other people have a right to opine about your right, rightful opinion. And you might not find them to be in the same camp. And the reality is that Med and it's always been known, there's nothing groundbreakingly insightful. Medicine is a social enterprise. You have people dealing with people, and people have a tendency to liking and hating other people. And things that make people dislike somebody uh, to the extent of det detesting somebody is if, you, if they feel disrespected if they think that you're saying what they do is meaningless. Um, and if, they f if you make them feel like shit, then you're not gonna get invited to their party. And the, real the, the reality is that there are lots of parties going on. The entire organization of academia, the committees, the um, uh, invitation to publish the peer review editorials. The first, it's controlled by people, not controlled by bots, it's controlled by people. And people see a name and they're like, no, oh, he's a bit of a dick, we're not gonna call him. And no amount of tenuring can protect you from that. Um, now, the United States is a very diverse place, so you'll find an audience somewhere might not be where he wanted to find it, but he'll find it somewhere. So the um, so during the pandemic, a few people made a huge name for themselves. And it's quite interesting how that has happened. I'm actually writing about this. Um, I think I've written about it now, so it'll be published hopefully soon. The first is the group of people that said that COVID is the worst thing since the plague. Um, they found, 
they became very popular in New York Times covered them their doomsday prophecy was great particularly when they invoked the fact that Trump was part of the um, problem then there was a backlash and people said that vaccines cause a huge amount of issues they became very popular lockdowns cause a huge amount of issues they became popular people that claim that we're being censored paradoxically became very popular so that's the nature of the beast um there are they're all in different sort of circles and that's again you could call it the tragedy or the beauty of the american system that many people had a had a home had an audience and and that's i think it's it's good that it exists that way but you don't have a right to anything you might have a right not to be fired by your academic place but you don't have a right to get into a plenary session at the rsna the people who decide that are human beings like you and I they have prejudices biases they have favorites and they they look at you and they decide whether to like you or not there might be an affectation of objectivity but it's a, it's very much of a social enterprise and you realize that when when um well I think you know I don't think there should be a surprise to anybody the surprise is that people believe that there is a a 100% objective it's somewhat objective and say that is totally arbitrary or subjective but it's not as much as people think it has been seen from from our training perspective as well you know there's a hierarchy that we must respect there's a ton of subjectivity that goes into um administration and leadership in general don't piss off the wrong people please mm-hmm. the right people right uh, but i think one of the interesting that you mentioned you know you said you know when you achieve tenure you know you shouldn't be fired from the institution where you work even though that quality has been called into question right you know they want the the crowd wants that attending or that professor who yeah. has that contrarian opinion to be fired from that institution uh, and i've yeah. seen it on both sides of the political aisle so to speak it has hap- i mean there is a pressure but there are also competing pressures so there are a bunch of people from stanford i don't know if you know about them that were very much against the lockdown and they felt that they were being censored and there was actually a letter from their colleagues at Stanford against them Stanford didn't fire them with had Stanford fired them Stanford would have gotten worse press than keeping them there's always a balance of um outcomes one and the other and the idea what has actually happened is that we have social media now and through social media we have a bigger reach than we might have um i mean this where else were there people talking having discussions in the past i mean there was i i don't believe that it i don't think it really existed to that scale yeah there were certain societies and philosophy uh, philosophical societies but you know people have this kind of bucolic view of the past galileo was put in a uh, jail for expressing his views of where the sun and the earth stood so i'm not sure that there was ever this golden age of you know free intellectual discourse there never was the difference is now that you've got social media which allows you to um project your opinion and scale it potentially doesn't mean that it'll be scaled but potentially but it but you know the the uh, the other side of the coin is that um you the same mob that can give you more recognition than you deserve can also go after you and make your life more hell than you deserve it's the same thing um you know it's like the whole saying those that live by the um, sword die by it right yeah so anything that gives you undue advantage could also give you undue disadvantage speaking of social media and ways to deliver your discourse do you think social media twitter or x now you know facebook zoom right is that the new grand rounds especially in the academic world and met twitter rat twitter who have embraced social media well i think you have the same problem that you have with scaling 
which is that if you can scale stuff, so can anybody else. So this idea that, you know, when somebody says, oh, anybody can make a YouTube video, um, that's great, but don't forget that anybody else can make it as well. The whole point of filtering was that it removed, uh, you know, removed the noise. Now there's a lot of noise everywhere. So there, there is still some sort of filtering process. Uh, yes, you can reach more people than you could before, but just bear in mind there are lots of people doing the same thing. So I'm not sure that probabilistically for any one person, it's better than it used to be. Do you have any tips or thought process on how we can identify hypocritical, illogical, commonly held beliefs, especially, you know, now that on social media, people seem to share all of their opinions, <laughs> right? How do we filter that out effectively, right? If institutions aren't gatekeeping and we have this omnipresence in social media, especially, you know, professors and attendings or whoever, you know, Dr. X, they, you know, they have their title, they have the blue check mark and they're propagating a belief. How do we filter these down ourselves as audience? Yeah, so what used to happen, and uh, still does to a large extent, is that you had trusted authorities, um, which is peer review publications. Um, and then you had places like New England Journal and Chama. And then you had publications like Atlantic, New York Times, New Yorker. And that process itself was, of course, not perfect. Again, it had humans guarding it. So the next round was that you had trusted individuals, influencers, who consumed information, processed it, and put it out to you. The thing with being an influencer was that you had two choices. You could either be kind of objective, although reality is nobody is perfectly objective, or you could choose a side. And a lot of people realize that when you chose a side, you did better. Because the thing about being neutral is that technically you could piss both sides off. But if you chose a side, there's a 50% chance that people would love you, a 40% chance, a 30% chance. With neutrality, there's a 100% chance that people would hate you. So, what happened was that you got a shift from institutions and publications to individuals. Of course, individuals cannot process information any better than the New England Journal can. Peer review, peer review I mean, is a flawed process. Uh, I've been a beneficiary of it, and I've also had my work thrown at me with great ferocity. And I, re I realized that, okay, so you're dealing with people who are people. And it's not as if you're dealing with the wisdom of the crowd, but the problem with the crowd then is that the crowd isn't necessarily wise because of its multiplicity and its number. You end up with another problem, which is that crowds tend to be tribal. So I, you know, I don't think that there is any kind of you know, magic bullet here. I think the reality is that you're... you're you're going to be, you're in a world where people will gravitate towards opinions that um, confirm their prior beliefs. There's always going to be some sort of epistemic asymmetry where they will hold certain pieces of evidence to a higher standard than other pieces of evidence. And in holding the evidence to a higher standard, they will appear objective until you go back and you look at the evidence that they didn't hold to high standard. And you say to them, what happened there, mate? That requires time. I used to enjoy doing that a lot. <laughs> My kids are growing up. I need to spend more time with them so I have less time to do all this kind of fun stuff. Um, you know, calling out people's hypocrisy because they were more lenient towards one piece of evidence than the other. But this is it. This is just human nature. And this is what you have to accept. So I guess it's inevitable that we'll kind of end up on one side. And um, and as you said, you know, the time factor is not in our favor, especially 
uh, as non-academics, you know, most radiologists or clinicians are in the non-academic world, right? and they're really not evaluating the literature or the evidence as critically as some academic clinicians, right? And so inevitably what would happen, uh, what I'm getting from your message is inevitably what will happen is we'll probably kind of quote unquote fall into our tribes. Um, yeah, but you know, the problem here is deeper than that. I think the problem here is that, and I don't want to sound like a nihilist, but there sometimes isn't a right answer. Mm. Because the right answer assumes a kind of a dichotomy of good versus evil. And when you're dealing with shades of gray, it's really the best you can do is sort of do an algebra of net benefits versus net losses. The biggest example um, is the uh, in our in our personal space is the extender issue. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I will not see face to face on that at all. Because, not because, not necessarily because this is some sort of culture war. It's because, in many ways, the points that you guys raised, I remember in the town hall, were legitimate points. Um, you just gave different value functions to them. We were all dealing with uncertainties of the future. You gave a different value function to your uncertainty, and I gave a different value function to my uncertainty. If you look deeper, the value function I gave, which was more to do with the fact that I think um, what I fear the most is overproducing radiologists, is something that was my own life experience. You know, I went through a phase when I saw the overproduction, I saw what it did to the market. Um, but I don't know if I'm correct any more than I know that you're wrong. So these sort of things can't be resolved. And they are going to be areas that you just have to say, it's going to have to agree to disagree. And there are many, there are many issues like that in the world, um, politically, culturally. Uh, it's not quite as simple as sensitivity and specificity. It's not like, OK, you've got those numbers. Now deal with it. Tell me what you want more of. It's the problem is you can't get those numbers. There are value functions that tell you what you value. And for me to tell you to value what I value is like for me to say to you, you should like vanilla, not raspberry, for instance. Um, that's not going to happen because you're different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You mentioned being a trusted individual on social media. I don't think which, I'm well, <laughs> I would say I would argue that you are, um, and maybe you're trusted for your contrarian opinions or just calling out people in general. Um, but I, I think for all, for all of us, you're one of the first radiologists to to follow on on, on X. You've started a, a podcast yourself called uh, Keeping Up with the Radiologist. What's your vision for that podcast? And kind of with your role as a trusted or non-trusted uh, individual, where do you see that going in the future? Yeah, so I used to do a podcast with the American College of Radiology, the JSCR, known as uh, Firing Line. And the idea was to bring discussions um, to, a, uh, to, a, you know, to a certain um, hub. So with Keeping Up with the Radiologist, the idea is to bring th the same discussions to Penn. Not necessarily always talk about pen, in fact, not talk about pen mostly, but to basically have pen people discuss radiology issues. So um, we could make it an intellectual hub. I mean, in many ways, to kind of complement what you're doing here. Uh, with any podcasting, the key thing here is firstly, you know, you're, you're obviously going to be gatekeepers to your podcast. Uh, you, invited me today and you didn't have to uh, but it was within your volition to do that so you end up being gatekeepers to what ends up being discussed these days i think we're in a we're in a space where you have to have some sort of social media outreach if you're an institution and it cannot be simply just saying how great you are 
Most people will not pay attention to that. People will pay attention if you say, I'm flawed, or this is controversial. That's just the way it is. Otherwise, there is a ton of accounts out there. So the hope with the podcast is we do discuss the flaws. We do discuss the controversies as well as the gains. And we explore issues pertaining to radiology and beyond at its edge to the extent that it's possible. Um, I recall uh, some years ago, I did a, um, I did a, uh, discussion, I wouldn't call it a debate, it was a discussion with a prominent uh, breast imager, Daniel Copans, for uh, Medscape. It was, for the most part, respectful. <laughs> I'd say 95% of the it. But I think it was an important discussion to have. I mean, we had very opposing views on overdiagnosis. Um, he believed it was exaggerated, and I thought it was underappreciated by the radiology community. In a sense, we were both right. I mean, I think we were right because I did point out that we need to acknowledge it. But he was also right that it's been overblown and used as an excuse to uh, gut screening programs. You have to have those discussions. Um, and you know, as a field, radiology has to be more introspective. Cardiologists are very introspective, and we kind of, you know, they their pet procedure stents. It's their own lot that have gone out of the way to show that it works or doesn't work. Cardiologists are very introspective. Certain fields aren't. I don't think emergency physicians are terribly introspective. I think they play the violin quite a bit. Uh, you know, sound or where where you know troubled and. Um, I think we have a tendency to do that too, uh, and I th and I don't think that helps in the long run. What you want to do is you want to show that you can criticize yourself, criticize your field, and not just come up with um, simple talking points. Go explore things a little deeper. Talking about controversial topics between attendings and residents and fellows, where is the biggest disagreement? of how we view our training and how we interact with the health system that maybe we're not even talking to each other about? Yeah, well, I think that's a good question. And I'm, I don't have a huge amount of experience with residents, only Penn, which is all actually a very skewed representation of reality. Um, because what we do is we filter out and just you know, it's like Yale Law School. They take uh, the highest scorers on the LSAT exam and then claim to be a great law school. Um, I think the first issue is that there's got to be a greater understanding about what pedagogy is. Um, if all you're doing is churning through cases, that's not, you know, I don't think we're adding much. So there is that disconnect between the being an apprentice and being a um, um, being taught. And we follow very much the apprentice model, where we're kind of, you know, you're semi-autonomous pretty much after, I mean, you know, you're semi-autonomous after two weeks of CVI. <laughs> Um, that helps you make decisions, so it's not without its gains, but I think that um, it makes education less fun. Um, I also think that we have very diff we have slightly differing views on the longevity of the field. For many of us, it's like you know five years uh, or ten years. For you, it's obviously 30 years. So you have more skin in the game, but we have more experience, and that's the clash. Um, it'd be great to have your horizon, our experience, but that's not going to happen. Because by definition, 
the more experience you have, the more attenuated your highs is going to be. I'm not sure that there's a way around that. But one of the things us residents have really appreciated about your reports is how concise and the, the brevity of your reports sometimes allows us to quickly kind of look over them, find the most relevant findings, and then move on to read our own kind of the imaging that has been ordered, right? What makes reports so concise, one of the things is, I think there's a lot of incidental findings that we are oftentimes asked to report that many of us fail to see the value. No, not because we are junior trainees, but even talking to some of the fellows and upper level residents, they do it because some of the other attendings have always done it, right? Do you see any value of reporting incidental findings? So if it's the index study, then I think you should, uh, because often what's going to happen is the referring physician is going to look at it and say, oh, he didn't see something. Um, I think you have to not make a song and dance about it. And one way of making a song and dance about an incidental finding that is of no clinical importance is by measuring it in every single dimension to two decimal places. That's just a waste of time. If you see a renal cyst and you think it's benign, say it's benign. If you measure it and you say it's benign and it happens to be malignant, you'll still get sued. Nobody's going to say, oh, but he measured it. Let's not sue him. In fact, you'll get even more sued because you clearly noticed it. You clearly gave it some importance, but you turned out to be wrong. Um, I think brevity isn't easy. And brevity forces you to think about the issue. Uh, I don't think you do people a favor by going on and on and on in the report because everybody's bandwidth is limited. If, if they have to read through reams of to get to what's important, they will not appreciate the value of that importance. Um, one example I'll give you, which ended up being a lawsuit actually, was that somebody reported aortic dissection but then we're not say that there is no active bleeding. That is not some, That is obviously something you should always look for. But to say that in somebody with an aortic dissection made the other person believe that it wasn't that important. The whole dissection. But there is no active bleeding, you know, that kind of qualifier. So you have to be careful what you say. You have to improve your signal to noise, express your certainty, uncertainty, um, and with these chest x-rays that get done four times a day, you're not doing anybody a favor by rehashing the entire report every four hours. You, or yourself for that matter. It's a surveillance study and you just put forth what has changed. Um, I, think the, I think the whole idea of... A lot of the emphasis on radiology reporting has been on standardization. I think it should also be on concession, on brevity, because that really tells you, you convey to the referring physician that you know what's important. So if somebody has an aortic dissection, a type A aortic dissection, and that goes on your impression, if number two is diverticulosis coli, number three is the 12 millimeter adrenal nodule, then I think we're, we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice of being physicians. The rest should be in the body of the report. Agreed, agreed. I think that's where the, uh, the, the variation of style sort of come into play. And unfortunately, I think this is one of the things that uh, we will probably appreciate more and more when we're signing our own reports. Because yeah. at the end of all of our reports is attending attestation, which, you know, if we... Not that we, if we miss findings, but if we have the finding, but we have all that other stuff that should be in the body of the report, if that makes it to our impression, the attending usually puts in the most significant finding. And what referring clinicians usually do is they end up reading just the attending attestation. Right. Um, uh, but that, that's very, very, very important. I think that's a skill that is, um, I myself, and speaking about myself, underappreciate now, but I'll start to appreciate more and more as I progress through my training. 
our last oh, you. oh I, sh- I think I should I should say something as well yeah please so I think if I look at the way you guys are compared to what we were there's obviously a tendency to always think about um, my days things were more difficult you know the old we walked up the hill in the snow <laughs> but as, as I say to my kids who are you know, um, my older son is applying to college this year a younger one is going to apply next year uh I, I had it a lot easier in my time. Like I actually spent summers not trying to do research projects, but actually enjoying myself. None of that mattered. So I think things have become more difficult. But I will say, despite that increase in difficulty, um, there is value in um, there's value in constantly reading. By constantly reading, I don't just mean picking up a radiographic article. I think that there is value in choosing a book, not multiple books, a book, and going through it. And when I was doing GI radiology, I found Ruberson and Lawford's book very useful. Uh, They had a certain distinctive style. Uh, They put their thoughts together. In many ways, reading through that helped me a lot in thinking about the issue. And also in terms of thinking about the page and the differential. So I, I, I think that it's important to, I mean, there are certain things I think are always going to be innate in our learning. Um, people have found out that writing stuff, uh, just the physical act of writing, is still a great way of retaining versus typing, versus underlining. Um, And you know, there there are now devices where you can physically look, uh, emulate the curse of writing. So in the same way, I think that reading, having a book that you can keep referring to is very good. And I don't necessarily endorse the, um, you know, AGR article and a radiographic article and a radiology article. I would much, I much would prefer, I think that it's much better getting through a book from start to finish. It doesn't matter which one. I mean, there are lots of choices out there. The important thing is choosing one and then sticking to it. Yeah, I think it's that our learning styles now are just so different, right? Yeah, I guess so, yes. I'll give you an example, right? Uh, you know, for step one, you know, now, nowadays, some people don't even open a textbook, right? So first stage for you assembly step one is what's considered the Holy Grail or the Holy Bible for passing step one. But now we have flashcard apps that have the most relevant sections. And, you know, using timed repetition can really help us memorize some of the facts, obscure mm-hmm. facts that step one tests. So now there's this whole school of thought where people say, skip the book get the flashcard app and just hammer down those 15,000 flashcards and you'll do just as well. Um, currently, there are efforts to develop flashcards for radiology <laughs> uh, from the uh, core radiology textbooks, yes. right? And I presume in the near future, uh, it wouldn't be unusual for interns or you know, when, when residents are in their PGY one year when they're not doing any radiology for some sort of advice to pop up and say, hey, this is the time, if you want to learn radiology, just go through these flashcards and you'll have a fantastic start. And you'll know all those obscure anatomy, all those neuroanatomy, all those coronary arteries that you'll be expected to know when you start your rotation. I think it's coming. Um, but, you know, as you said, and Barry gives the same advice as well, you know, go pick up a book, read the book from start to finish. But it's just, I think... The way we have learned in medical school and beyond, and the resources that are kind of popping up, it's just different. You know, uh, textbook is just not. So, I, so I'm of a different generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not saying you know your approach is right or our approach is wrong. You know, it's just it's just a different way of learning. Um, speaking of a different way of learning, our last question is you know let's. Picture a scenario where you're made the program director of Pran Radiology. What is the number one change you would make? Uh, 
Well, you don't have to say Penn Radiology, but in radiology residency in general. I think you've got a kind of um, conflicting forces over here. And one is that people are getting more atomized. They come to work, they go home, and we're kind of losing the community. The question is, what's the value of the community? In a sense, by the traditional metrics that we use, if the metric is board's pass rates or um, RVU generation or, or a very uh, reasonable metric in your, in the case of um, residents here, is your job offers. Which, by the way, I would say that the um, prior practices are hunting you guys down like hyenas. They want you because apparently they've heard you can churn the list. <laughs> I'd say that, yeah, all of that's important. But, you know, why us? Why academia? Why, why shouldn't private equity group or a teleradiology group uh, just have you sit at home for four years and uh, train you? What is the value of what we do? What's the added value of what we do? And I think it's community. And you can go axe throwing as a community event, uh, which is great. But ultimately, the community events are ones that involve some form of learning. And you can't mandate it, but you can create an environment where it's highly encouraged. Like I think it's hard, but it can be done. Years ago, we used to do this uh, book club, which I wanted to res resurrect, actually. I spoke to a bunch of residents about that, so if you guys are interested, we can bring that up. Um, we had some residents come over. Uh, we had some faculty come over, and so we had a faculty resident um, uh, exchange of um, ideas over the book club. But fundamentally, you're here on the residency, Everybody's going to go and do their own things after that. The most you're going to do after that is if you're at the RSNA, you'll come to the Penn Alumni Reception. That's it. After, if you're not in the Philadelphia area, you'll be amazed how people disperse. The community is something that used to exist. It doesn't exist to the same extent. No doubt about that. And that's a loss for all of us. It's a loss for the residents loss for faculty, and it becomes a self-reinforcing phenomenon where since you, since there's not that much of a community, you end up thinking later on, what's the value of the community? And people do telly and sit at home, and then, you know, the field becomes dispersed. And I, I think that's something to be careful about. What would be one thing you would do to kind of restore the community? Or what is one thing that you guys used to do back in the day to keep the Penn community strong? Yeah, I don't think anybody thought of it as let's do it to keep the community strong. But there were a few events that um, had community enhancing effect. One of them was Journal Club, which was held in the evenings and was held with cheese and wine. Mm. So it wasn't just simply a, a dry event. It had some flavor to it. Another one actually was a wine tasting event organized by Wally Miller Sr. Um, variably, we've spoken about bringing that in. Uh, but what he would do is it was called Famous Resident of the Past. So he would honor a resident of the past it wasn't there, of course, but it's simply honor. Everybody came and they had to, they tasted about you know 15 to 20 bottles of wine and had to guess the price range of it. Um, and so uh, these are small things. Uh, I'd love to do the book club. I think the book club is a great way. Uh, we also used to do debates um, between residents on controversial things, which I would monitor. There's a famous picture of Stephen Hunt and Alex Rutanian debating the constitutionality of uh, Obamacare. Uh, it was published in Art Mini, actually. 
So we, we you know, we did those. There are lots of ways. There are lots of ways to intellectually engage. And that, I think, is the problem where, with what we are at now, is that the days are harsh. People want to go home um, at the end of it. Um, but I don't think that's the whole picture. I don't think that's the whole story. I don't think it's just simply a case of, oh, I've gone through so many studies, I'm tired, I need to go home. I think there's also um, the absence of these um, covalent bonds that used to form. And the pandemic, of course, everything is now blamed on the pandemic. The pandemic simply accelerated what was already the trend, but um, it took it to a different level. Yeah, well said. Uh, Fortunately, we are kind of coming to a close. Any uh, parting thoughts to our listeners, future radiology residents, future radiologists, current residents? Well, there's a tendency to end on a positive note. Well, firstly, I mean, I, I think this whole thing about computers taking over jobs is patently nonsense. Um, so there's no fear there. The biggest fear is what what do you want your job to look like? And if there are generations of people that just simply become our view generators, then uh, radiology will lose its magic. So at some point you have to carve some space out and restore the magic within it and um, think about it very much in terms of as being physicians. Uh, not um, you know, you have to resi- you have to resist being becoming a commodity, and that's a constant struggle that you that you're going to face. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, Harry, thank you so much once again for coming to our podcast and sharing your uh, interesting thoughts uh, to us young future radiologists. Well, thank you for having me. But yeah, absolutely, it was our pleasure. Uh, definitely one of the more interesting conversations we have had. Um, well, I won't ask you who you've spoken to. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us in this episode of Clinically Correlate. We'll see you guys next time in our future episode. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>